In the 1990s, a modified Soviet-era nuclear submarine roamed the Norwegian Sea. NATO named her Yankee Stretch. I called her Sierra One. What you're about to watch is an excerpt from my Yankee submarine briefing. I was on board a submarine assigned to track the Yankee Stretch during our month-long missions. This is a first-hand account of where the Yankee Stretch went, what she did, and the tactics the Russian Navy used to protect her from people like me. This is Sierra One. All right, so let's talk about K411 Yankee Stretch. This is my girl right here. I tracked the hell out of her for many years. Well, a couple of years, not many years. Uh, K411, uh, she's Project 09774. Of all the Yankees, I, I know the most about her. She uh, was laid in 1968. Her She was launched in January 1970 and commissioned uh, eight months later in August. In the end of August uh, at the, of the next year, 1971, she reaches the North Pole. So she's got the tow bowl navigation system because that's what's required to do that type of transit. So she's uh, either testing it or showing it off. But it's a big PR, uh, not stunt, big PR move to say, hey, we can go to the North Pole, too, just like the Americans can. You know, we aren't reliant on magnetic compasses only because the closer you get to the poles, the less accurate your magnetic compasses are. For those of you that may not know that, they have to use a different type of navigation technique. Uh, 1974, she completes a missile patrol in the North Atlantic. Now, keep in mind, we're not in the Pacific anymore. We're talking about the Atlantic side of thing. In 1977, she dry docks for Project 667AN. Her missile compartment is cut out, lengthened um, to a total of 162 meters. She's the longest Yankee submarine of the class at this point. From 1982 to 1990, she becomes uh, KS-411, the carrier mothership for deep submarine Poultice. It took her eight years uh, to, to get the insides of her, you know, gutted out. Essentially, they built a big moon bay uh, type thing. Well, it's not that big, but a place where another submarine can dock into her underside. And that other submarine is a mini or midget submarine called Poultice. Now, Poultice technically is a science vessel. So it's not a warship. And they took the weapons off of K-411, making her a non-combatant. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, from 1990 to 2000, she conducted deep submarine support missions in the Norwegian Sea. And that's where I got to interact with her. I spent a lot of hours watching her doing 240 degree turns every five or six hours in, right off the coast of Norway while the Paltus was down there moving around sea cables and placing listening devices and, you know, possibly damaging sea cables, whether that was intentional or not, they did it, you know, and we just had to know where they were so that whenever they were done, we could go in there and see what the hell they did. And, uh, that was, that was a small portion of my career was doing that. And, uh, let's see in 1998, uh, she does get the honorary name Orenberg. And in 2004, she's finally removed from service. And in uh, 2014, her reactors removed, placed on long-term storage. So let's talk about the Pultus and the Yankee Stretch Project. This is a great picture of her, uh, the Pultus docking on the underside. And you can see where that little hatch is there. It's not as big as I may make it sound. It's just enough for the, for the halibut class, the Pultus, to come up and, and mate with it. Um, she is the only Yankee stretch. They only made one of these. Uh, I imagine because it was so expensive to convert. I mean, it took them eight years just to convert the submarine from a ballistic missile submarine to a science vessel. Uh, she's a carrier for an ultra small submarines. There is more than one Pultus. Uh, there was a uniform, um, but I don't have any experience with the uniform. I don't know if the uniform ever operated with Yankee stretch. Uh, I imagine it could have. Uh, I just wasn't involved in that. Missile complex replaced for the docking bay, like I said. She gets two extra diesel generators, a couple extra electric motors, because whenever they're docked, she's supplying electricity to both submarines. And because she has two nuclear reactors, that's not a big deal, but she also needs the electrical generators to, to supply it. Uh, she has two 112 element batteries, uh, increased living space for all the extra people on board. Because not only do you have your Navy crew, even though it's not a warship anymore, you still have a Navy crew on board, but you also have engineers and scientists and technicians because they are doing deep sea research while they're also doing clandestine other things that we were keeping an eye on. All torpedoes are removed. Technically, Yankee Stretch, after the modification, is not a combatant. That's kind of a big thing in the military world. You don't 
shoot, destroy science vessels. You know, it's just not done. Think of it like a hospital ship. All right. So here's where uh, I saw the Yankee stretch go. This is based on my personal information. This is my interaction with her in the early nineties. Uh, she would go along our cable runs that allowed our continents is, keep in mind this is before internet got really big. Okay. A lot of communications between continents. If it's not a satellite phone call, which would be like government level, military level communication. Uh, a lot of it was sub C cables. You know, a lot of communication between if you want to call your grandma from the United States to France, you probably used a subsea cable at some point uh, if you weren't on a satellite network. So anyway, they would go along and they would look at our subsea cables, communication cables, and they would find them. They would document where they're at. They certainly did that. Sometimes they would plant magnetic listening devices, which is just a box. You sit next to the cable with a magnetic field around it. its magnetic generator uh, with permanent magnets. So it doesn't need power, but it can detect the data flow through the cable because the data flow will interact with the magnetic field of the box that they lay. Therefore, they can record the conversations or they can at least record the data. And then they come back and they pick up the box after a few months or whatever, and they go do whatever with the box. Well, whenever they do that, we have to go make sure they didn't mess up our line. Uh, a couple of other things that we can do is whenever we know a cable is been tampered with or possibly being tapped and recorded, we can push false information over that C cable. So there's a lot of advantages to following the Yankee stretch around, even though it's not a combatant, it's not a ballistic missile submarine. Uh, it, is, it was definitely gathering intelligence about NATO or cross Atlantic communications. And a small part of my career was making sure that we knew where she was and after she was done, make sure the right teams get in there and make sure everything's okay. Anyway, that's my small contribution to the Cold War. All right, so here's Yankee stretch tactics. I see this stuff in my sleep. I tracked her so much. So let's start with, uh, let's start on the outside and work our way in. So outside, we have the red line. We have this big, thick, you know, sometimes 10, 12 inches around sub cable that has lots of little cables inside of it for communication, right? And it's you know, bound in steel and rubber and it's watertight. And uh, it just lays on the bottom of the ocean. Very, very deep. Um, so the Russians will decide that, Hey, they want to listen in on the cable or they want to do something with the cable. So they send out, uh, the Yankee stretch with the Paltis attached to it. And, uh, ahead of them will be an SSN providing overwatch. So the first thing that happens is the Victor three normally, sometimes it's in a but a lot of times it's just a Victor three will come up on station and begin hanging around this area. Kind of like just doing lazy circles, sometimes a figure eight. And uh, that's how we know we're like, all right, something's going on. <laughs> send out send out Aaron's team <laughs> we're gonna go figure these guys out so we start tracking the uh, Victor 3 which is not that quiet it's pretty easy to track that thing um, they never figured out her reduction gears were her Achilles heel uh, we could hear her reduction gears miles I mean hundreds of miles away it's great anyway so we know where the Yank or we we know where the Victor 3 is at so we send uh, a submarine sometimes I'm on it uh, to go track the Victor three that's just hanging around, just loitering in this area off the coast of Norway. And sure enough, the slower takes longer to get there. Uh, Yankee stretch eventually arrives, not trying to be quiet, by the way, she's a science ship. She's not, doesn't care how much noises she makes. So you can hear her coming from a mile away too. And she'll start doing this pattern over the communication cable uh, that looks kind of like a star. It's just like every five, four or five hours, she'll clear her baffles in a very aggressive maneuver. So you don't want to be anywhere near her whenever she's doing this. So normally what we did, because the mothership wasn't trying to be quiet and the poultice sounds like a damn egg beater. It's got so many arms and legs and tr tread tank treads and wheels on the bottom that none of it is sound silenced. We would stand way far away you know, tens of thousands of yards away, recording everything that they did. We got their exact location, but they would do this for months. I remember spending five, six weeks, you know, going on watch again, being like, what's going on? It's the same thing as it was like Groundhog Day. Um, you know, I remember the most exciting thing that happened normally during these operations that lasted five or six weeks was when the Victor three would leave, we would be like, why is he gone? Why, why is the escort gone? That's because there was a new escort and it was quiet. And we were like, there's somebody else out here. We got to find out who's the new SSN. And usually it would be like the Akula, which back then was the new kid on the block who was quiet when they first came out. And so we had to be very careful because we knew the Akula was doing the same protective circle around the mothership operations, but we couldn't hear her. 
And eventually, you know, we would find her and be like, okay, there she is. Keep an eye on that. We don't want to lose her again. Uh, but we would operate outside of the um, patrol area because one, we don't want to cause a collision. It was peacetime and the mothership isn't trying to be quiet and they're not really doing any harm to the communication cables, even though they could. I mean, if it was wartime, they could basically cut the cables, if I imagine. Um, but we didn't have to get in close to do our job. They did their job, we did our job, and the Cold War stayed cold. Hey, thanks for watching my YouTube video. If you want to check out more of my content, come on over to my Patreon page where I have multiple submarine briefs, very detailed videos that go in depth about a class of submarine, whether it's the Akula, the Typhoon, the November. There are about 17 of these briefs right now, uh, including seven audiobook style briefings. And of course, pictures of Bianca over there on the Patreon page. And if you want some more free content, check out my articles on the War Zone. That's right, I'm writing for War Zone magazine now. And I contribute articles a few times a month over there. So definitely check out uh, the War Zone magazine. Hit up Tyler Rogaway's articles as he's a really good writer and he has brought me on board his team as a contributor. And uh, check that stuff out there. All the links are in the description and on the tags above. We'll see you over there. Bye.